my name is Maxine Kwok and I'm a first violinist with the London Symphony Orchestra. We're here at Warner Music to talk about this new recording. Renaud Capuçon, Stephen Huff, the London Symphony Orchestra and Sir Simon Rattle performing Elgar. I'm going to be chatting to Renaud Capuçon, the violinist, on this recording, Stephen Huff, the pianist. And what's pretty amazing about this recording is we managed to record it during last year's pandemic. Social distancing meant that the orchestra had to sit very far apart, but we still managed to make an incredible recording and I think you'll really enjoy it. Reno, it's lovely to see you. We've worked so many times together in London and abroad. What was it like coming to London last year to record this Elgar in such a challenging time? Well, it was a kind of miracle to be able to record this, this amazing violin concerto with the so I have to be honest, until the last minute, uh, I thought it wouldn't happen because there were so many problems, um, you know, with traveling to England. So I was so excited when finally I met Simon. Uh, the day before, I could just go through the concerto and then meet in the orchestra. What is so amazing with this orchestra, and I don't say it because you are part of it, but because I really feel it, you get surrounded by this incredible sound and this incredible energy. Absolutely. At the beginning of lockdown, you were really active with playing on social media. Was that because you missed the element of live performance or you actually felt you should really be engaging with your audience during the time of lockdown? I just took my violin and I thought, let's, let's just play. And I asked my son to film it and I put it on, on Twitter, I remember. And I wrote day one and then I wrote day two and day three. Um, so I began to play every morning uh, at nine o'clock. And sincerely it became for me something which helped me a lot because I could um, I had this goal every morning. I was looking for the patois with my pianist, who was not there, so he was recording, sending his. But it took a lot of time. And also, what was incredible was the reaction of people. People have a really stylized idea of Elgar, I think because of its Britishness. How aware of that were you when you were recording this, being the first French violinist to do so? Or do you think that nationality shouldn't matter when recording music? I believe this music, Elgar music, of course, is amazing. And Chrysler, to whom the piece was dedicated, was a huge fan of Elga. He considered Elga as, as Bach or Beethoven, as a huge composer, which I, I believe also. Um, I think in France, we, we know the composer, we know the voice variations, we know perhaps one or two symphonies, but I, I really don't find any reason why, because it's a lyrical music, it's harmonically incredible. Um, the harmonies are absolutely fantastic. You've also recorded the lesser-known work, Elgar's Violin and Piano Sonata, with the British pianist Stephen Huff. What was it like working with Stephen? Have you performed together much before? Well, meeting Stephen was, was um, actually one of the most amazing meeting, musical meetings in my life. We met a couple of months before, uh, less than one year. We had to play the three bars in, in Wigmore Hall, so it was just before the lockdown, I think, in January. Um, we wanted to play together since years. We wrote email and it was never happening. So finally, we, we, we met with these three bars in Athens and uh, we just played them through the day before and another time and then we played the concert. It was so natural, so musically organic. Um, but when I thought about doing this, this Elga Sonata, I straight away thought about him. And uh, we had exactly the same way of, of working and playing when we were recording uh, this wonderful piece. So it was, it was a really a treat to be able to, to discover and to play this Sonata with him. Thank you, Renaud, so much for answering these questions. The recording is something to be so proud of. I really hope we'll be back on stage together very soon. And now I'll be chatting with British pianist Stephen Huff, who is the other soloist featured on this Elgar album. Hi Stephen, it's lovely to see you again. Now, what drew you to this Elgar violin and piano sonata? And is it really different to perform with just one other soloist than actually playing with a full orchestra? 
Well, absolutely. Hi, Maxine. It's fantastic to see you too. Yeah, I mean, the difference is, is intimacy, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, it's two players playing the sonata. You make all the decisions between yourselves um, as against a whole orchestra of dozens of people and the conductor between me and the players. And as you know, that can sometimes be a wonderful experience and sometimes not such a wonderful experience, but we won't go into that. <laughs> it can be challenging. You know, I think that's the main thing. And I think also with um, this music of Elgar, this particular sonata seems to me a piece of all kinds of possibilities. You know, it unlike some pieces, actually many of the Beethoven sonatas, where there's a pretty direct path, I think, between what's in the score and what you end up doing with, with yourselves. In the Elgar, yeah, there's an awful lot in the score. And in fact, sometimes every single note has a different marking on it. But also it's much more elusive. Um, the music could go in many more different directions. And so that makes it uh, extra challenging, I think, as chamber music, because you have to, to read each other in that way. And maybe you have a slightly different view on it and find a meeting point. Absolutely. And of course, Elgar wrote a wealth of music for string players, especially violin, you know, with the concerto and all the beautiful gems of, you know, Chanson de Matin, Salut du Mort. Do you find as a pianist a bit hard done by that he never wrote anything that really featured the piano as a big solo instrument? In a way, um, although we have the quintet, which I think is actually one of Elgar's greatest works, one of his last pieces, an incredible piece, um, similar to the sonata. I think they were written at the same time. Yeah, he composed at the piano, apparently. Uh, and in fact, I, I remember reading with the Enigma Variations how he would, in the evening, sit down with his wife and say, well, who do, which of my friends do you think this represents, as he played one of the <laughs> those, those portraits? But he wasn't a pianist, and I think you can certainly tell that. The music is awkward to play, and it sounds beautiful, but it doesn't lie under the hand. This is not someone who really understood. But actually, being a string player as he was, there are all sorts of, of neat little things in here. He actually writes in portamenti for the pianist. So, of course, the violinist at that time would have done lots of slides. And I've even put one here on the piano, which I think is really great. This is obviously a portamento. <laughs> He writes that uh -huh, little yes. arpeggio in, which is me imitating what the violinist would have done. So uh, he, the, the piano part is full of sensitivity and care. It's just not, he was no Liszt. He was no Rachmaninoff. Uh, he just didn't have that kind of idiomatic understanding of the instrument. Yes, I think you're you're right there because his the string writing is so fits so well under the instrument. Certainly from a violinist's point of view, playing symphonies and the Enigma Variations. Do you think it's really important um, to show these lesser known works more to the public who who may think of Elgar as having written Nimrod and Pomp and Circumstance, not really know the the chamber works like the Sonata and the Quintet. Oh, definitely. And I think it's also good to be re-examining who Elgar was. I mean, we see these photographs of him and he looks terribly stiff and very English of that time, that Edwardian gentleman thing, uh, taking his dog for walks in the, in the fields and so on. But, you know, Elgar, I, for me, was one of the great neurotic geniuses. I mean, people talk about Mahler. I think Elgar is more neurotic than Mahler. There's more of this self examination. There's, of course, the incredible sexual side to Elgar that people don't talk about. I mean, a lot of it was repressed, but that doesn't make it any less powerful. And I think we need to talk, we need to sex up Elgar. Not, <laughs> not that we'd want to see him wearing a Speedos or anything, but I think we, we need to see that what makes this music so powerful is that he was not part of the English establishment. He was from a poor family. He was a Catholic. He was from the Midlands, not from London. He didn't fit into the English mold. And so I think particularly when we take a piece like the Sonata outside of England to people who don't know Elgar, except for a couple of pieces that get played a lot, this is part of the message. And I think this is what I was talking with Renault about. It's so marvelous that a French violinist, you know, is, is taking this piece up and, and the concerto too and playing with such love and understanding and, 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 and care of, of, of this music that sometimes in England we, we take a bit for granted. Now obviously in this challenging time you must have missed live performances very much. Do you think when we go back to really playing on stage again you're going to come back to it with a much greater 
appreciation of, of what we've what we've had in the past. I'm sure it, it, it's hard to say, isn't it, exactly how we're going to feel and exactly what will be happening. I think certainly as an audience member, um, there'll be a tremendous hunger to get back into live performances, where it, whether it's concerts or opera or theater, all of these things I think we really you know, are longing for. Um, as performers, yes, that's very true, but I also wonder, I hope I still have the nerve to do it, you know? It's playing concerts, it's not just playing your instrument. You, you learn over years a certain experience of just what it means to, to play concerts, to travel to somewhere, to arrive, to rehearse, to go to the hotel. All of that side of it is something that we all get used to and learn the tricks for. And so I hope they're still there. I hope it's like riding a bicycle. One of Elgar's <laughs> wonderful bicycles. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Stephen. It's absolutely beautiful recording. And I hope lots of people will have a renewed enjoyment and discovery of Elgar after hearing it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maxine. Now we hear from the music critic Charlotte Gardner. Hello, I'm Charlotte Gardner and I'm a critic and journalist for Gramophone magazine and The Strad. My own first associating runner with this particular concerto actually goes back to January 2018, even though I hadn't heard him do it. I arrived at his Swiss musical festival, Somme Musical de Gestalt, and um, I arrived and he wasn't there. He disappeared just for the one night to Salzburg to play the Elgar concerto. And just hearing that that was what he was doing, I suddenly thought, oh my gosh, Renaud playing the Elgar concerto. Of course, um, you have this wonderful, his, his blend of romantic, tender, but not soppy warmth, nobility, dignity, all the things that make his Brahms so wonderful. Um, they were just clearly a perfect match for the Elgar. So I found myself in this bizarre situation of sitting literally in a winter wonderland on this mountaintop in Gestad, surrounded by wonderful musicians and thinking with every fiber of my being, bother, I'm in the wrong place, bother. So so then it was just, when I heard that he was doing this album, it was literally, I was popping the imaginary champagne corks. Finally, I was going to hear him playing this concerto I had wanted to hear him play, and with literally the best possible collaborators. When you have been joyfully anticipating recording, it's always a little bit of a terrifying moment when you first click play, because you're just, hoping um, and it was just so nice when I clicked play on this one just everything about it just felt so so right right from the get-go um, from the LSO you have this wonderful big rich depth to their sound um, weight without it being cruise ship weight they can still turn on a pin should they need to there's this wonderful flowing energy to it and and flow is really the word. Um, all across, the tempi are just so well managed. Um, if you look at the score to this particular concerto, Elgar, who's constantly speeding things up and slowing things down, um, tempi are constantly changing. And then comes Reno, this wonderful combination of tenderness, dignity, nobility. He's flying, singing over the orchestra, and it's absolutely wonderful. With a concerto recording, it's not just about getting the soloist and the repertoire matched up, it's also about who the other collaborators are. And the wonderful thing about this recording is that absolutely every single person involved is just so right, both for Rano and for the repertoire. Um, in terms of the orchestra, you've got the LSO. It was them who premiered the concerto back in 1910 with Chrysler as soloist. And it's just in their DNA, it's in their heritage. It's something that Rano is very aware of. And as a critic listening to it, um, again, I feel very, very aware of that. As a whole, um, it's, it's just the most wonderful combination of pieces, of artists, of musical personalities just being a perfect fit for a repertoire. Um, there is not a single thing I would change about this album.
And now we're going to hear from Martin Cullingford from Gramophone. I'm Martin Cullingford. I'm the editor of Gramophone magazine. I thought I'd share a few words about why I've decided to put Renaud Capuçon and this album on the cover of our March issue. I'm always fascinated by perceptions of Elgar and his music internationally, um, apart from a few key works, the, the Violin Concerto, the Cello Concerto perhaps, the Enigma Variations. He doesn't have the, the, the place as a sort of giant of that late Romantic European repertoire that, that I, I feel he should. And, and there's no better way to address that than, than moments of extraordinary advocacy for the works um, by an artist like Gweno, by an album like, like this. Um, and then the collaborations just really intrigued me, the, the, the people who's working with us on this album. There are a few more um, eloquent and exploratory musicians than Simon Rattle. Obviously this has been a, a very difficult year for, for, for everybody, but particularly for artists and the people in the, in the music world. And for a recording like this to emerge from that period of time, from a city which felt in many ways sort of closed down and in lockdown, and for this extraordinary um, powerful music to have been recorded and, and produced within that environment. It adds an emotional poignancy to it. And I think at this very difficult time, it, it, it represents a sort of beacon of, of, of hope and, and light that the music making like this continue to exist. So I hope our readers will be really excited to, to read about this. Um, I was very excited to, to hear it and, uh, and I wish it well. Congratulations. This is, it's an absolute triumph of recording. It's stunning. Um, it's going to be one that I'm going to be listening to out of choice for year after year. Um, so thank you for making it. Thank you. Congratulations to Reno Capazon, to Sir Simon Rattle, to, to Stephen Huff, to, to Arato and, and everybody involved in this project on a, on a really wonderful release. Um, and, I, and I hope it gives an awful lot of, of pleasure to everybody who hears it. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I've really enjoyed talking with Renaud and Stephen about this new release. I very much hope you enjoy listening to it as much as we all enjoyed recording it for you.